Hello, my name is Laura McKee, and I'm the former director of the Lucy Burns Museum. You are in the Lucy Burns Museum right now, which is located at the Workhouse Art Center in Lorton, Virginia. I'm gonna take you around today, show you some of the most interesting things here, and talk a little bit about the history of the prison that was located here in Lorton for 91 years, and also about the suffragists who were imprisoned here in 1917. So let's get started, and I'll take you around and show you some of the uh, exhibits that we have. And I want to encourage you to come down yourself someday, too. The prison opened here in 1910. It was a workhouse, which was a place for men who had been arrested for drunkenness, vagrancy, and other small petty crimes. It was and continued to be throughout its lifetime the prison for the District of Columbia. And even though it was located in Virginia, it always was for the district. The land belonged to the federal government and the um, county Commonwealth of Virginia had no jurisdiction here at all. The um, prison grew from the very small beginnings uh, of the workhouse and then expanded over time into what amounted to eight separate prisons. The person who started it, believe it or not, was Teddy Roosevelt. He felt that the prisons in uh, the district was in terribly bad shape and that needed to be uh, upgraded and maybe even a model for the country. So even while he, he appointed a commission while he was the president and then subsequently after he left the presidency, the next president continued on with the idea of having a prison here. This was a picture of the old jail in the District of Columbia. And you could see from some of the things we have here on the wall that the first prison, the workhouse part of it, was actually a big farm. So what we did here was we raised cattle, we had a dairy, we had a cannery, we had a, uh, an orchard, and we raised lots and lots of crops uh, for the prisoners as well as for the animals who were, here, who were here. In the early days, up until the 1950s, all the farming was done with draft animals, either with horses or mules. And so it was necessary to grow the feed for all of those animals, plus the dairy and beef cattle that were housed here as well. Um, as time passed, a, a reformatory was built, and then a maximum security prison, and then a youth center. Uh, so at one time, there were eight separate prisons here, and there were over 7,000 prisoners. Again, all from the District of Columbia. You can see up here on the wall the uh, picture of central facility. That was the medium security facility in the snow. This picture was taken by one of the prisoners. It's very difficult to get pictures inside of a prison for, for those of us who are on the outside. So for prisoners to take pictures, as they did with this one, is really a great way to actually see what it looks like inside a prison. Things were not particularly good here. Um, it started off with the highest of principles. But over time, particularly as drugs became more and more readily available, both to the general public and to prisoners, uh, things became more and more desperate here. The courts uh, and the Congress decided that there would be mandatory sentencing for drug users. And that meant that the uh, prison became more and more crowded because people were being sentenced who might otherwise have gotten off with lighter sentences. You can look in this case here, and you can see what, what was found inside of a drug user's cabinet here at the prison. In addition to his ID and a calendar, which is 1993, a New Testament, uh, and of course a weapon. Every prisoner had a weapon, despite the fact that the uh, administrators, the guards here, would sweep 
the dormitories on an irregular basis and confiscate everything that was uh, illegal, and that included all of the weapons. They continued to make them. In addition, there's some drug paraphernalia here as well. So even though in the prison, uh, it was, of course, illegal to have drugs. Nevertheless, somehow, they managed to smuggle them in. Here, this gives you another idea of the kind of weapons that were made from very, low, hand, very simple uh, items. Scissors, spoons, a piece of sheet metal, a screwdriver, all of those things could be made into weapons. And we have in our store here a uh, hundred more weapons that were confiscated by either the corrections office here or by the FBI when they came as well. Things were pretty desperate here as we got into the 80s and 90s. Uh, the prisoners tried to burn down this facility in 1986 and managed to actually totally burn eight buildings here at the uh, Occoquan uh, facility. The workhouse was renamed the Occoquan facility in the 60s. And so if you read old things, they talk about the workhouse at Occoquan. Or if you read later things, they just simply say the prison at Occoquan. One last thing to take a peek at to give you an idea of the crowding that took place here in the end is this picture of a, a former gymnasium that has been converted to a dormitory. Most of the prisoners at Lorton were housed in dormitories. You are standing in what is, was a former dormitory prison building. Um, it was made of brick, as are all the buildings here. Uh, the bricks were made by the prisoners in kilns down by the Occoquan River. The prisoners built the buildings, all of the buildings, both here and at, uh, at the reformatory and at the penitentiary. Uh, and they did all of the plumbing, all the electric work. And so they were learning skills as they were imprisoned. Now, let's go talk about the suffragists who ended up being imprisoned here in 1917. In 1960, a uh, chapel was built at the reformatory, and a cross was created for the Catholic section of that chapel. It was made out of plaster. Some of the plaster was actual dental plaster from the dentist's office. And you can see the figure here. It is the Christ on the cross. The face is that of a former, of a prisoner who was in, in prison for life for murder. Uh, the wood for the cross came from the prison grounds. And the uh, prisoner himself as different from most of the uh, figures one sees on a cross, does not have a wound on the left side, but is woundless because the people who made the figure were indicating that Christ was still alive and still in prison. To begin our story about the suffragists, we really have to go back a little bit and talk about the the beginning of the suffrage movement. You have to have a little historical uh, situation to know what was going on. In 1848, a group of women from, the, from Western New York State got together and had a conference on, on issues relating to women uh, at Seneca Falls. And so we talk about the 80, 1980, 18, excuse me, 1848 Seneca, Seneca Falls Convention. Um, Susan B. Anthony was there, and so was Frederick Douglass, believe it or not. Um, the well-known um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton was not there, although later on she and Susan B. Anthony, Susan B. Anthony and Kate, Elizabeth Cady Stanton became good friends and worked together for the next 40 years. 
the convention was important because they created documents which stated the kinds of things that women felt they were owed as being uh, part of the United States. One of those things, of course, was the right to vote, but they also wanted civil liberties as well. At that time, women could not own property. Anything that was uh, owned by them was either handled by their husband or by their father. If they worked, their wages went to uh, their husband or their father, uh, and they had no control how they were spent, where they were used to pay the rent, buy food, or go down to the local tavern for beer. They had no control. If they separated from their husbands, the children automatically went to the husband, no matter what he did to cause a separation. So the, in terms of rights, women basically had no rights. They were certainly not citizens. The women who participated in the conference in 1848 continued to work diligently uh, for the right to vote and expanded their membership tremendously. And soon women all over the country were joining in the issue. However, Congress made no move to uh, let them have the right to vote. However, a few states west of the Mississippi that came in after, to the Union after the Civil War did give women the right to vote. So there were a few states in the West who were allowing women, but the majority of the states did not allow women to vote and had no intention of changing that. A younger group of women came to the fore in, a, in around the turn of the century, and they began to move more vigorously toward getting people accustomed to the idea of women having voting rights. In 1913, uh, a group of women organized a huge parade on Pennsylvania Avenue. Uh, it took place on the day before Woodrow Wilson's first inauguration and was meant to imply that Wilson was in favor of women having the right to vote. In fact, he was not. But it was a good way to get people to see what was going on because over 8,000 women marched in that parade. And because there were so many people in town for the inauguration, many, many people could see the women and see how committed they were. However, the parade became a melee, and women were forced to walk in very narrow single file. The crowds came off of the sidewalks, pushed and pushed and pushed, and the police did nothing to control the crowd. Finally, um, they had to call the cavalry from Fort Myer to come and uh, disperse the crowd and protect the women. Over 100 women went to the hospital. Fortunately, none were killed. The organizers of the parade, though, were really not too upset. Why? because at that time, the only way you, you could get the word out, remember this is 1913, were the newspapers. And the newspapers wrote articles which appalled what went on. They felt that the behavior of the, of, of the people who were there observing was unconscionable, and so they got lots and lots and lots of press, which is what they really wanted. I mean, they didn't want to hurt anybody, but they were not disappointed when they got such positive press. The two people that we're going to talk about with some fr frequency are the two that organized the parade. Their names were Alice Paul and Lucy Burns. These two young women had become involved in the suffrage movement in England. Um, they had gone to England to do graduate study. Both of these women were extraordinarily well-educated for the time. Both had received undergraduate degrees here in the United States and had gone either to England or to Germany to study for doctorate degrees. They met believe it or not, in prison in London. They both had been arrested because they were campaigning for women's rights in England, where they were going to school. They heard their voices 
in the prison. They heard two American sounding voices and found each other and became fast friends. Now, they were very, very different people. Alice Paul was a Quaker from New Jersey, and Lucy Burns was a Catholic Irish American girl from Brooklyn. But they were so an aligned in their goal for women's having the right to vote that they uh, became um, organizers both in England and then when they returned to the United States, they joined an organization called the National Association of uh, the, uh, poof, I always forget that, National American Women's Organization. They became too radical for that organization and they formed a new party called the National Women's Party, NWP, in 1917. The other organization that they had belonged to was working at the state level. They felt that they would, that the best way for women to get to the right to vote was to go state by state by state and have the states, as they had in the West, uh, make women eligible for the right to vote. The organization that these two women founded, the NWP, felt to the contrary that uh, uh, they should be going to the Congress and there should be a, an amendment to the Constitution which would allow women across the country to vote. They felt that without that, that it would be impossible for the southern states to give women the right to vote because they were so much opposition in the South um, because of the fear that if they gave white women the right to vote, that black women would also have the right to vote. And that was not to be sanctioned in those southern states. The women who were hoping to get the, the um, Congress to, to, to um, create an amendment decided that they would picket and they would gather together and they would picket the White House. They would go directly to the man in charge who was Woodrow Wilson at the time. They came to the White House um, in the winter of 1917, in January 1917. This is in the summer. They continued to picket all through the winter and the spring and summer. <coughs> You can see that they are wearing the banners, which were, if we could see the color, purple, white, and gold, which were the colors of the organization. They carried banners that were purple, white, and gold, or that um, addressed the president or the people walking by, saying that they wanted the right to vote. They wanted the right to vote. They wanted the right to vote. They stood silently in front of the White House. They didn't scream, holler, yell, or anything. They stood silently. They called themselves silent sentinels. Here you can see some of the banners that were carried in front of the White House. We demand that the American government give Alice Paul political a political offender, the rights given to Russia. To ask freedom for women is not a crime. Suffrage prisoners should not be treated as criminals. All sorts of ones. Here is one. This is, remember that at this time in 1918, the United States had gone to war with um, the Axis powers, which was Russia and Austria, excuse me, Germany and Austria. And so they are comparing President Wilson to Kaiser Wilhelm in Germany. The president was, did not like these kinds of banners, even though they were displayed very um, quietly. For the first six months, the, the uh, picketers were left alone. But in the summer of 1917, the uh, women were arrested by the police and first put in prison in the, in the district jail. 
And then when that uh, didn't stop them from their picketing, they started arresting more and taking them to the women's workhouse in Occoquan, Virginia. This was a big change. Remember, these women had been arrested for simply standing in front of the White House with banners. They were accused of blocking access to the sidewalk or uh, creating crowding conditions, but um, they really didn't do anything. In this logbook that we have for, um, from the District of Columbia Jail from 19, the summer of 1917, this is the original logbook, the women on this page were accused of unlawful assembly. And it lists the name of the, of the suffragist uh, and the date of the arrest uh, and what they were sentenced to and where they were sent. And so we see that they were sentenced on the, uh, in July 14th, 1917, and they were sent to Occoquan, in this case, for 30 days. Some of the women who had been arrested more than once received longer sentences. Some of the women who were older, one of the picketers was 72 years old and uh, had a bad leg, she was only um, sentenced to uh, a week, whereas Lucy Burns, who had been arrested twice before, was sentenced to six months. This is a big statue, larger than life, of Lucy Burns, as she might have looked giving a speech. Women would, in automobiles, stand up on the back seat and give speeches in, the, in public in many places around the country. Uh, she was famous for that. She apparently was a wonderful orator. She was tall, red-haired, and had great presence. And she's the reason that we named the museum the Lucy Burns Museum. Her more famous partner, uh, Alice Paul, was also arrested, but she was sent to the DC jail, whereas Lucy Burns was in prison here in the workhouse on three separate occasions. The women who were arrested, there were five separate occasions when women were arrested and brought down here. First, it was just a trickle, and then the last arrest, 72 women were actually brought down and put in prison. They were treated harshly from the beginning. They were forced to wear prison clothes. You see an example there. And uh, were not allowed to communicate with their lawyers or with anybody. Um, they had unclean bedding. They were in dormitories with African-American women. Um, the sheets and, uh, had not, or blankets had not been changed after the last person was there. Um, they had um, not, no soap. In the, in the showers. Um, they didn't have any personal um, things with them like combs or toothbrushes or anything like that. They were stripped of everything but their prison clothes. In November of 1917, that largest group came down, um, were brought down to Lorton by train. Uh, that group was treated worse than any previous group had been treated. Um, they were um, rounded up in the, in the uh, superintendent's office where he surrounded them with um, guards and then told them what was going to happen to them. And they protested and said that they wanted to be treated like political prisoners. And uh, Superintendent Whitaker said no. They picked up the elderly woman who had a bad leg and threw her into a prison cell. Uh, she hit her head against the side of the um, bed and it knocked her out. Uh, another woman who was in the cell um, had a bad heart and she thought that, that the elderly woman had died and so she had a heart attack. The women who were all around them started calling for guards to come and help these two women. 
and no one came. Um, no one came for these women for over um, two days. They did not get food or water for almost two days, and nobody checked on them. Our, our heroine, Lucy Burns, was calling out the names of the women who were prisoners there to check and see that everybody was accounted for. She was told to shut up or they would put a brace and bit in her mouth. What they did eventually, though, was to take her hands and handcuff her hands over her head uh, to the bars of the prison cell that she was in. And she was in her petticoat because she refused to wear prison clothes. And they'd taken her clothes away. And she was in a cell in November that was unheated. And she had her hands over her head like this all night long. And if that isn't bad treatment, I don't know what is. The, some of the women decided that they would go on hunger strikes in protest. What is a hunger strike? A hunger strike means that you don't eat anything. You might drink water, but that you don't eat anything. Uh, after two uh, uh, days of hunger striking, the superintendent decided he was going to force feed the women because he did not want them to die and become martyrs. So what is force feeding? Force feeding is taking a tube putting it down your nose, into your stomach, and pouring, what they did here was pour raw eggs and milk directly into the stomach of the woman. It hurt going down, the tube being inserted, and, and when, when the women wrote about it afterwards, it hurt very much in the stomach because none of the gastric juices that not normally accompany food as it goes down into your stomach. And so it felt like a big ball of lead in your stomach, an undigested ball of lead. And they would do that three times a day. It was awful. And yet they continued to hunger strike. Why? They were so determined, so determined to get the right to vote that they were willing to die. And that's something we need to remember. These women were willing to die for the right to vote. Subsequently, they, their lawyer got in touch with them and was able to get a writ of habeas corpus, which means show the bodies. So the women were taken, all the women who'd been arrested were taken to the courthouse in Alexandria, which was the Northern District of Virginia's headquarters. And this was a federal court. And the federal judge looked at the condition of the women and looked at what they had been arrested for and said, these women need to be released. And so after only a couple of weeks, the women were released. But it was a horrible experience for all of them. And you can see a picture of our friend Dora Lewis over there. This is, this is her coming out of the courthouse. She, could, she had been hunger striking. And she could barely walk. She had to be supported by two women. And you can see that she's lost a lot of weight, too. She looks, she looks really bad. Here at the museum, we have listed all of the women who were imprisoned here at the women's workhouse. And you can see we have the photograph of that woman, her name, of course, where she comes from, and then what position she held with the organization, and which of the protests that she was imprisoned for. Um, there is no other place in the country, in the world, where you can actually see, the, see all of the women who were imprisoned here, and in most cases, see a picture of them. You can tell that they are of all ages, and uh, so we, the youngest was, uh, 19 years old, and the, as I said before, the oldest was 72, and there was everything in between. Most of them were, all of them were white. However, there were several African American women who picketed with the group at the White House, but none of them were arrested, fortunately, because they would have been treated even more harshly than the white women. Most of the women were middle class, 
but some of them were working class women, and a few of them uh, were actually came from Europe. So um, Jacoby was uh, um, from Europe, and um, um, I can't, um, anyway. So we have all of them here, and it's good because we've had some of their descendants come and visit, and they feel so proud to see their grandmothers or their great-grandmothers memorialized here. What happened after these women were imprisoned? The public opinion had gradually begun to change. People were becoming more and more attuned to the idea of letting women have the right to vote. Women had um, managed to persuade the legislature in the state of New York, and so in 1919, uh, New York State uh, allowed women to vote. This was a, a signal to the Congress and to the president that the, that the um, attitude was definitely changed because at that point in time, New York was the largest, most populous state in the union. And if they made the, ch if they made, w made the change, then it was likely that the states would. So finally, <clears throat> a, the states uh, excuse me, the Congress passed the amendment, which they called the Susan B. Anthony Amendment, and sent it to the states for ratification. You can see here a picture of, that's Alice Paul up there, and she's got a banner, which was purple, white, and gold, onto which she has sewed a star for every one of the states that ratified the amendment. And so it took, at that time, 36 states to, uh, to, uh, to uh, be three-fourths to ratify the amendment. It would be more now because at that time, Alaska and Hawaii were not states. So this is a celebration of the states ratifying. It was not an easy thing for them to do, however. Uh, there is a wonderful story associated with Tennessee. Tennessee was the last state needed for the ratification um, to be successful. And so the, con the, uh, the legislature in, in Tennessee got together in August of 1920 to vote on it. At that point in time, the organizations uh, for and against were uh, presenting roses to those legislators who were for and against. The ones for the legislation wore yellow roses, and the one against wore red. This young man, um, who um, was the swing vote, um, was named Harry Byrne. He was the youngest legislator there. This was his first day on the job. He came from a country uh, constituency who had said they were opposed to the right to vote. So he was wearing a red rose, which meant he was opposed. But what happened? That morning, he received a letter from his mother. And in that letter, his mother said to him that he should vote for the amendment. And so when the group the legislators were assembled, and the vote was called for. He actually voted for it. Since his name was pretty early on the list being burned, the tallyer kept going. And then all of a sudden, he said, what? And he said, excuse me, what did you say, Representative Byrne? Uh, you were, and he said, I am voting for it. And everybody was amazed, because that was the winning vote. So it, the uh, amendment passed by one single vote. And later on, Harry Byrne was asked why he changed his vote. And he said, a good boy always does what his mother tells him to do. And that's a true story. One vote. And that one vote leads me to say how important it is for us to vote. These women were willing to die for the right to vote. And yet, and yet, we still don't vote as we should.
here you can see uh, a list of the states that ratified and when they ratified the amendment. These are states that later ratified. Virginia did not ratify the 19th Amendment until 1952, well after it passed in 1920. And Mississippi was the last state to ratify as it, it did in 1984, which is a long time after. However, as you all know, the Constitution says that if three-fourths of the states pass the amendment, it is applicable to all the states. So in the South, women were allowed to vote. However, however, in 1920, there, there still were people who could not vote. American Indians, no American Indians could vote. No Asian Americans could vote. None of the residents of the District of Columbia or of our US territories could vote. And most importantly, no African American men and women could vote in the South and in many places in the North because of the Jim Crow laws. So it took until the Equal Rights Amendment was passed before everyone basically had the right to vote and could vote and did vote. However, here we show uh, four African-American women who were very active at the time uh, the white women were um, asking for the vote. Uh, they were active themselves, uh, working with primarily black women uh, to get the right to vote. Two of them are local to the Washington area. One is Mary Church Terrell, and the other is Nanny Helen Burroughs. In DC, uh, a, a district in, in the um, District of Columbia is named after her, and a school is named after Nanny Helen Burroughs, and, is a, and a street is named after her as well. Um, these women were extremely well educated and um, worked with black women of, from all parts of life to get the right to vote. Lastly, let's just briefly look at when women got the right to vote around the world. It could become a test for you. Which was the first country to allow women the right to vote? New Zealand. New Zealand. Soon followed by Australia. Then we went to the Nordic countries, Finland, Norway, Denmark. And believe it or not, Russia got the right to vote Women got the right to vote in Russia before those of us in the United States. They got the right to vote after the Russian Revolution. The last states that I could find who got the countries that got the right to vote were the countries, the Arab countries, uh, Tunisia, um, Saudi Arabia, and Kuwait and the United Arab Emirates. So you can see that it's a long distance from 1893 to 2015, but women all over the world have been pushing for the right to vote in ways that, are, that work in their countries. Uh, in our country, it worked as a picketing and a protest and banners and articles in the newspaper and speeches. Uh, in other countries, it's done in other ways, but always women are asking to be considered equal citizens and part and parcel of the community of that country along with men. We are now entering the adjustment section of the workhouse. This was built uh, in the 19 80s, uh, changing what used to be a dormitory into what are called adjustment cells. Uh, these cells are designed for men who have um, broken the rules in some way or another. They were not created for long-term um, occupancy, but men could be sentenced to from two weeks 
to two months in, in one of these adjustment cells. You see they're very, very bare. Um, two bunks, a commode, a sink, and a place to sit. And men were allowed out for only one hour a day if they behaved themselves. If they didn't behave themselves, then they were in there 24 hours a day. Uh, food was brought to them. They ate at the table. Um, they had um, only magazines. Um, and occasionally the Bible to read, and that was their sole um, entertainment, if you will. Uh, they, if they behaved, they, the hour would be spent walking up and down this corridor. That was the only recreation that they had. Um, and of course they were let out only one at a time. So they might be doing their walking in the middle of the night We've taken one of the cells and created a, um, a diorama to show you what force feeding looks like. Uh, you can see that the suffragist is seated. Uh, the doctor, it was always a doctor who did this. Uh, the cord is going down the woman's nose. You can see the um, funnel and the attendant would be pouring milk and eggs directly down her stomach. In point of fact, she would probably have been tipped back a little bit more. Um, and in most cases, it took up to four um, women to hold, hold the person down because rather than sitting calmly, they were struggling like crazy um, to um, not be involved in this. No! I was held down by five people at arms, legs, and head. I refused to open my mouth. Gavin pushed the tube up my left nostril. I turned and twisted my head all I could, but he managed to push it up. It hurts my nose and throat very much and makes my nose bleed freely. Tube drawn out was covered with blood. The operation leaves one very sick. The food dumped directly into the stomach feels like a ball of lead. This morning, Dr. Ladd appeared with a tube. Mrs. Lewis and I said we would not be forcibly fed. Will you pay your fine and stop ticketing? Again, he said no. He said he would call in men guards and force us to submit. He went away. But we hear them outside now, cracking in. Thank you all for joining us here at the Lucy Burns Museum. I encourage you to come and visit in person. We are open Friday, Saturday, and Sundays. The museum is free, and we're delighted to have all of you come and see it in person and see other things that we didn't cover in this uh, tour. The uh, website address is Workhouse Arts dot org slash Lucy Burns Museum, all one word.